All right, listen, Biden might have dropped out of the race, but he's running for butt chin of America. <laughs> Isn't it, like, what version of, how many Biden versions are there out there? Like, this is the, I heard this first from the, uh, the Timeline Earth guys, and I hadn't, I hadn't heard about it before, but do you guys remember Biden having a hole in his chin like that? Like, you could literally turn him upside down and you would have a cigarette holder, okay? That is how pronounced that is. And all right, my first thought when I see this is, what do you think happens to, like, the Biden clones? Like, do you think it's like the prestige where every night after they use them, they get killed off? Do you think they get sent to a Biden farm to run around with the other Bidens? Like there's some farm somewhere that the CIA just keeps and they're all just there running around going, hey man. <laughs> or I like to think about it like at the end of Godfather when he finally, Godfather 1, when he finally gets out of the race, there's going to be some montage where they literally just whack them all off. Uh, not whack them all, like jerk them off, but I meant like whack them. You, you get it. Um, all right. Hand jobs for everybody. Uh, all right, so here was Biden. I don't know what's so off about it. It's like he's leaving the race, but he's like the orange thing worked for Trump. Like, I don't, I don't quite understand the dynamic of why this looks so off, but it does look off. It does not look like the Biden that I've been watching. And the thing that I thought was funniest about this is that he's decided that he does need to drop out of the race, but he's still committed that within his next six months, he's going to cure cancer. Let's give it a listen. Our plan for climate crisis is the existential threat. And I will keep fighting my, for my cancer moonshot so we can end cancer as we know it because we can do it. What? I'm going to call for Supreme Ooh. Court reform because this is critical to our democracy. I always love how they're like, we have to change the rules for democracy, <laughs> right? It's like in order to have freedom, we have to change the rules of the system and rig the game in our favor because then we can have democracy. So firstly, it's back to that. And then I also just love, hey, listen, I'm too old. I can't stick around. But before I leave, I'm going to end global warming and cure cancer. <laughs> That, that takes some fucking balls to have to retire from your job because of your age and incompetence, but still to get up there and go, I'm going to get cancer cured before I'm done. All right, so now let's take a look at Kamala Harris, um, who she did, she did get the endorsement from, uh, from uh, Obama, which we will give a listen to that in a minute. But first thing I'd like to address with Kamala Harris is, what is this new shenanigans that we're all pronouncing her name wrong? It's like, I don't know, if you're going to be an Indian, black, other thing, just get a normal fucking name, okay? Yeah, if you're, and like, now what? Now I'm, yeah, I'm suddenly a racist because, like, I feel like everyone's been pronouncing her name the same way for the last three and a half years, and then all of a sudden, the only reason you're calling her that is because you're a disrespectful racist. Like, just have, see, just go with Cam or something. I don't know. Like, I don't know, is this annoying you guys also that suddenly we're racist for the exact way they've been pronouncing her name the entire time? I, I don't know, I don't know what, what it was and what it is now. I I'm mean, still Kamala, confused by it. Kamala. Maybe maybe that's just how racist we are. <laughs> 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 that we're like, no, I'm white, so I was getting it right the way I was saying it. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe, that, maybe that is on us. All right, so here is, she gets the call from, uh, from Barack Obama letting her know that she has the position. And I figured out who she is as a person. So I'm only gonna play about three seconds of this and then I'm gonna play a clip from a movie and then we'll watch the whole thing because when I play this for you, it's gonna shock everybody. All right. Come on. Hi. Hey there. <laughs> okay, I just wanna pause it right there and... Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> never going to un unsee that, okay? I've never even seen this movie. I think it's called The Room. I think that's what it's called. And it's apparently like the worst movie ever. And then you get this autistic guy who's just not a person. You can find montages on YouTube of the, just the, oh, hi, Mark. A and that is Kamala. She watched this to figure out how to be a person. All right. So let's, let's actually play the full footage of Obama talking to Kamala. Come on. Hi. Hey there. Oh, hi, you're both together. We called to say Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and, and into the Oval Office. Oh, my goodness. Kamala Harris locking up endorsements from these White House veterans just days after... Uh, apparently... Yay. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you guys reading my notes? Uh... <laughs> Who, who leaked my notes? Um, 
All right, apparently I didn't realize I downloaded the shorter version of it, but it's kind of a sweet call because you get to, you know, see a person living their deep state dreams. So it's nice seeing her watch her actually get picked by Obama. What happened behind the scenes that she's been managed to get endorsed, endorsed from everybody? I can almost see Obama, like he was sitting there like, uh, as long as she's blowing the boys, we can keep her around. <laughs> Usually, only a man can get me, but Kamala, she's got a firm grip, which must be the retard strength. <laughs> and if she's going to continue blowing the fellas behind the scenes, I will give her my endorsement, at least until we can figure out the Epstein's Island situation. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, and I, maybe I'll be the first to this conspiracy, because it's weird. We've all watched her fumble and blunder and be the world's biggest idiot, and now she's got the glowing endorsement of the entire deep state, which makes me wonder, is that Jew guy really the guy behind the scenes? <laughs> He's been out there yelling about anti-Semitism and shit. Is that what's really going on? Is he, is he the, uh, the wizard behind the curtain? Of course, she's dressed like a fucking Harry Potter character. <laughs> All right, and then now they're all trying to sell us on Kamala Harris, which uh, it's been an incredible week of everyone pitching us on Kamala Harris. And so let's listen to a little bit of CNN talking about how incredible her early now lead in the polls is. Let's give it a listen. A quote, great wake up call. That is what one Trump campaign insider says they're experiencing now that Vice President Harris is a likely Democratic nominee. That same Trump insider telling my next guest, quote, it's going to be harder. What we could have gotten in earned media, we will have to now pay for. And another warning of Harris, quote, we underestimate her cultural appeal and her power at our peril. Up front now, Mark Caputo, the national political reporter at The Bulwark, who broke this story. And Mark, all of this is your brand new reporting. So, I mean, just how, look, 10 days ago or two weeks ago, anybody talking about this potential switch on the Democratic side. I'll pause it there. I'm watching the news now, and it just feels like Don King trying to move the gambling lines. Isn't that what it feels like? Like, my fighter, he's been training the other guy. It's like, it literally just sounds like they're trying to move the lines. And for anyone that's buying any of this bullshit from CNN or any of these other networks telling us that she's actually now up in the polls, remember what they were telling us about this guy? Beto O'Rourke, do you guys remember the way they were saying, oh, they finally found their person? They tried running him in three different races after they kept parading him in front of us as that this was the glorious, genius, most competent, and he fumbled every single time. So I don't know, have you guys been watching the news as they celebrate and say, who knew this show of strength that the Democrats would have coming together, everyone behind Kamala Harris, they've never been more unified. Even Donald Trump is afraid that he now has to get into the ring and debate this fucking retard. Like, do you guys, do, do any of you guys believe this to be true? Like, I, I've seen it before. And it, it, it almost amazes me, though, that these people are willing to just kind of keep going with this, even though they're going to have to keep doing the news in a week. Like, why do you guys, why do you even dig these holes for yourself? All right, so this is now, we've got Granny Panties coming out. That's not her. It's uh, Elizabeth Warren. What do you think scares Trump? Well, what should scare Trump the most about a general election against Vice President Harris? A tough woman scared <laughs> <laughs> you get this old granny panties coming out saying that Donald Trump is going to be concerned because he's up against a tough woman. Like that, that's going to be, that's Donald Trump's kryptonite. Here we go. President Harris. A tough woman scares yeah. Trump. Uh, also, Trump, I think, is very afraid of someone who knows how to hold people accountable. Think about Vice President Harris's years as a prosecutor. She's someone who's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with people who bluster, people who bully, people who lie. And she has held them accountable. She doesn't get distracted. She doesn't get rattled. She just tones in. And she delivers. This is their big, like, uh, talking point. It's I'm telling you, it's promoters selling a fight. And so now their big thing is that since she's a prosecutor, she's going to be able to hold Donald Trump accountable. And courtrooms are not like debates. They don't operate the same way. I'm sure she used dirty tricks when she was putting petty potheads into jail and sucking off uh, Brown for better positions. Like, 
There's no, I'm just saying this is their this is their big piece of propaganda. Is she knows how to hold people accountable. So Donald Trump is going to fumble in front of her because she's a lady and a prosecutor. Uh, it's not happening. But this is the way that they're trying to sell it. And now we've got Kamala Harris's first campaign ads. Um, I've seen two of them so far. And so let's give these a watch as they try and sell Kamala Harris to us. In this election, we each face a question. What kind of country do we want to live in? There are some people who think we should be a country of chaos, of fear, of hate. But us, we choose something different. So I, I, I even just want to pause it there because it's such a fun spin to say, hey, we're trying to bring everyone together while being incredibly divisive and accusing, the, this is like the, I mean, Dave says it all the time, it's the punching someone in the face and then going, why did you hit me, right? This is what they're doing. They're, they're, they play the thematic music, they go, hey, this other side is so dangerous and divisive. Well, you're being divisive as you claim that the other side is, be, that's a divisive thing. That doesn't bring people together. So first is, I, I just find that piece of propaganda to be fairly remarkable, to be playing dramatic music of this is how terrible the other side is which is a large group of the population that supports Trump, and then saying we're here to bring people together. But now, here's the other part that is libertarian should bring us some hope. We choose freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. This is how we got to hold these. You do not choose freedom. That is not your thing. Your thing is forced wealth redistribution. It's fourth wealth redistribution at the highest levels. Like, is it, is it freedom if everyone here doesn't want people pouring over the southern border? If I own a house and I don't want people in my house, and you tell me I have to put people there, is that freedom? How is that freedom? Freedom is protection of property rights. That's what freedom is. Yeah. Freedom is you don't yeah. take my taxes to support things that I don't support. Woo. You don't force me to pay to, for someone else's abortion. That's not freedom. So if there's something like highly offensive that we almost just need to re-educate people because people want freedom and it's just like, I don't know, it's, it, it doesn't seem to me like it takes a ton of education to call people out that this isn't, if your forced wealth redistribution is not freedom. Quit using our word. Oh, wait, why did it rewind? The freedom not just to get by, but get ahead. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to make decisions about your own body. We choose a future where no child lives in poverty, where we can all afford health care, where no one is above the law. We believe in the promise of America. And it's, it's literally a description of forced wealth redistribution and using political parties to target your enemies, and a description of that as freedom. All right, now her other campaign uh, placement was even more insane. Did you guys see this? No. Oh, all right, well then you're in for a treat. Here we go. We are all in this together, and your vote is your power. So please make sure your voice is heard this November and register to vote at vote.gov. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now on with the show. And remember. Yes. Yes, thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I just, <laughs> could you be, <laughs> I just look and like, can you be any less cool? You know what I mean? Just if you're trying to sell yourself, is there anything less cool than doing this? Like the complaint was that you were unlikable. As I said during the, the stand-up show, she's the only person with a worse voice than Bobby Kennedy, right? She's been, <laughs> she's been unlikable her entire, and now her first placements are, Firstly, it's the preachy thing that we all have to absolutely love this culture, which is, it's fine if you like it. I don't care, like, I don't care, but I just look at this, I'm like, you're trying to win people over. You're trying to win over the middle. You're trying to expand your base. And then this is the early efforts that they're making with these old school celebrities, most of which I don't know. There's that, who, who's the, uh, that's the NSYNC guy, right? Oh, that's the queer amongst us. He's not one of us. <laughs> Guy, guy fell right for my trap. <laughs> All right. What was that? NSYNC rules. All right. So now the new thing is, and uh, with that view, we can't quite, quite read it, but uh, 
Firstly, if I can get to a level of my career where someone just puts together talking points so I can just drink, I would like that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I like that. You got to have dreams. That's what's on my vision board. It's just me sitting in a dive bar in the afternoon and showing up to a studio where someone's just got these talking points. Uh, so these talking points are about how there was never a position called a border czar. And I remember when they rolled out Kamala Harris as the border czar. Do you guys remember that? Yep. Yes. And the reason why they did it was because Joe Biden basically needed a fall person. And he was like, well, Kamala Harris doesn't do anything around here. <laughs> so he's like, let's send her to the border. We'll say that she's in charge of the border. And then when we don't do anything, it's on her. And they paraded around on the news that she was the border czar, which I, I mean, I could see her going, SARS Russian, and we're against the Russians because they're the most evil thing. So I would never have used that word. But anyways, they're now trying to pretend like the position never existed. It never happened. It wasn't her. And I just love pettiness, but the Congress got together and they voted on a resolution to condemn Kamala Harris. There you go. Condemning Biden administration and Kamala Harris for her failure at the border. So, you know, for all their talk of uh, the way that uh, government agencies have operated or the investigations into people. I guess good luck walking away from the border czar title when you were formally condemned by Congress for uh, you know not doing a, jo a good job in your position. I mean, how do you walk back that you didn't even do that job? But they're gonna continue to do it as one of the biggest blunders of the administration. And if you wanna call it a blunder, you're being favorable. I think that they were intentionally trying to get as many people into the country as they could. Um, they certainly uh, created policies through the pardoning system that incentivized people to come over. And then there was all the money that was given to non-government non organizations. Uh, so it, it would appear to me that the Democrats have intentionally been trying to get as many people over the border as possible. Uh, but, you know, they like to pretend, hey, we would have passed this resolution if the Republicans just would have gotten on board. And if you guys didn't follow this on the show, I dug in on that. It was literally a res resolution that, one, didn't get rid of the pardoning system. So it didn't matter what the hell they were talking about because that's the core thing that is just letting people into the country. And two is it basically just legalized the current illegal level of uh, immigration with this claim that once we got over a threshold, then Biden would have the authority to close the borders without any explanation of why you had to get to that threshold. The whole thing was a lie because, as I've said, in my opinion, they've been trying to get as many people over the border as possible. But in trying to pretend like they were solving it, they put Kamala Harris on the case. They did call her the border czar. And now they're trying to walk away from it. So we can watch uh, some of the news footage of Kamala Harris before and afterwards on the border czar. Quote unquote, border czar. Vice President Harris was not a border czar. Being time Vice President and border czar Kamala Harris facing some backlash. What he said about Harris and immigration was not true. She was never appointed border czar. Uh, and this will be her first visit to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border region since she was appointed as the border czar by President Biden. People have to counter the misinformation. You already hear folks talking about the border czar. She wasn't the border czar. President Biden tapped Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, to be the border czar. Now, she wasn't the border czar. That's what Republicans uh, labeled her. They were very critical of Kamala Harris, especially in her role as border czar. Now what she's up against is folks lying about her border record, calling her a border czar. Kamala Harris, who was appointed as the border czar. The Biden team didn't declare her the border czar. They wanted her to work on kind of the root causes of immigration. Mm -hmm. It's just like they pretend like they weren't on the news at a previous point in time. Isn't that a weird way to live your life where you make a public statement, it's on the record, it went out on TV, it was recorded, we have a record of it, and then you just pretend like that never happened. It's a very weird way to live your life. Um, oddly enough, this was reported from the Wall Street Journal, um, but they are claiming Harris erases Trump's lead, um, which I guess means that some of the polling must be initially showing that she actually... Uh, is gaining momentum, even though that this is being reported now by conservative media, I'm calling bullshit, right? I, I don't know, I don't, think that, I don't think Kamala Harris has a chance. I still think that there's a good chance that they have to replace her with someone else. Biden was still in the race until he finally had to debate Donald Trump. I don't think Kamala Harris gets out of a debate with Donald Trump, but the latest information, even from conservative media, is that she's gained enough ground that Donald Trump is no longer in the lead in the polls. All right, let's move to our next story. But before we do, 
Sheathunderwear.com. Who out here? Who's wearing their sheets? Who wants to show off their sheets? Yeah, yeah. promo code RYM. You get you get 20% off the greatest underwear that's ever graced the balls of man. Josiah's already admitted he has a tiny dick. He doesn't want to show it off out here. He's already, sorry, I, this is going out. I, humidity. Humidity, there you go. This guy. This guy's here to show off the sheets. There you go. Charles showing them off. Woo! All right, not just that. Right, right into the camera. That's yeah. going, that's going out into the world. All right, there you go. <laughs> Sheathunderwear.com, the official sponsor of the Run Your Mouth podcast. All right. Um. So now this is from California. The Supreme Court passed that law that essentially um, homeless people can be removed from uh, from public areas. And so this was from the Week magazine. California orders mass dismantling of unhoused people camp. Do we really not have to, we can't call them homeless? Like, like, why does everything need to be a stupid, shitty fight over language? Like, homeless was a perfect, like, or, or what, now we're, fe- like, we're nervous about offending homeless people? What, what, what are we gonna do? Are they gonna feel bad and do more fentanyl? Like, you know what I mean? Like, why, why is this that I have to live in a world now where we have to be concerned? All right, and so here's what I think I break it down from, is that, um, out unhoused is language that it's like something happened to them. Like homeless is that we you have to acquire a home and they weren't able to acquire it, so because they can't acquire the home, they are now homeless. Unhoused would suggest that the status that everyone should have is in a house, and yet for some reason the house was taken from them. You understand the socialism of this? It's that everyone deserves a house, and these people are unhoused because it's as if it was removed from them, and so therefore we need government to step in and give them homes. And so, what was that? It's like food insecurity when they did that. Right. Like, yeah, it's the same thing. Um, okay. So, oh, and the, the, my other thought on this was, why impose, victim stab- may, why impose victim status? Maybe they prefer the lifestyle of doing fentanyl under the sun, you know? <laughs> Like, why, why are we pretending like they need these uh, new terms? And then we got Gavin Newsom up there who, every time I look at him, I'm like, is he giving a speech about hair? That's just what he looks like to me, you know? And, and, and then it's always fun when, like, he's ever trying to take the moral authority because if it was popular, he'd be sacrificing homeless people to Moloch, all right? Like, that's who he is as a person. And then he's up there and he gets to pretend like he's got the moral high ground. And then of course it's, listen, we got to take immediate action, but we got to do it in a nice way. And we're not going to, it's like, they always got to pretend that every action is without consequence. And so this was interesting to me. Mr. Newsom, who is widely viewed as having presidential aspirations, has channeled about $24 billion into homelessness since he took office in 2019. All right, now honestly, I'm not great at math, but let's see, and you guys can correct me on this. I failed finance classes for six years in college. There's a good chance I'm wrong on this, but I looked at that. $25 billion over the course of five years is $5 billion a year, right? $5 billion divided by the 165 homeless people in California is $30,000 per homeless person per year. $30,000 per person divided by 12 is $2,500. That's fucking rent. (laughs) We are currently paying for a mortgage for every homeless person in California what is actually going on that any single person is homeless? It sounds like we've dedicated enough resources that every single one of them could have had a mortgage paid for on a house. You guys live out in Bumblefuck. Anyone here paying $2,500 rent? No. All right, there you go. California spending more than when, <laughs> what the AJ Theater costs. <laughs> All right. Now, as I was saying that I love pettiness, there was a news story where uh, the head of the FBI, you know, they're all they're asking all these questions about what was going on with the uh, Secret Service when Donald Trump got shot, and so Chris Ray, that's the head of the FBI, right? Chris Ray, here's what he had to say: With respect to former President Trump, there's some questions about whether or not it's a bullet or shrapnel, or shrapnel that hit his ear. He said. And I just love the pettiness that you can't just give it to Trump, right? Like you have to, the the head of the FBI has to get up there and clarify, oh, we're not sure that he was actually hit by a bullet. Does that fucking matter? Does it matter, right? Donald Trump was clearly nearly executed by the deep state in front of our very eyes. 
Or you could say that the Secret Service was so negligent that some putsy kid was able to climb onto a rooftop and take shots at the president. Does it change the situation in any capacity whatsoever if he was actually hit by shrap metal and there was still an assassination attempt on him and he still got cut in the ear and he still got up in front of all of us and went, hey, we're gonna fight? Does it make any difference whatsoever if it was a bullet or shrap metal? It's just so funny for like all the things that the deep state won't comment on, just the pettiness for him to show up and go, oh yeah, that wasn't really a bullet, right? And then here you go, they went, this was all the headlines, everyone was you know, piling onto Trump. FBI says it might not have been a bullet. FBI director says Trump may not have been shot by bullet. <laughs> FBI investigating if bullet or shrapnel hit Trump. And uh, here's what I say, instead of figuring out what happened, let's just put all of our resources into this. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, what, we, how can we continue as a country not knowing if he was hit by a bullet or shrap metal? Like, that's, that's what, you know what I mean? Let's pause all the investigations into what was going on at the Secret Service, how someone was able to get a shot off on Donald Trump, and instead, let's just do the investigation of bullet versus shrap metal. All right, and then you had this guy, Daniel Goldman. I don't know if you guys know him. He's like one of just these just liberal, you know, uh, like uh, loud mouths, I'll put it that way, absolute lawyer who stands up and goes, we must see Donald Trump's official medical records. So first is, what difference does it make if the doctor goes to a shrap metal or a bullet? Does that impact the story, the situation, or what's going on in the country in any capacity? Josiah, what are you trying to pull off? No, no, no. I want to see Babyface Biden's medical records. That's what I was about to get to. You guys are looking at my notes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If there's something that's consequential in regards to medical records, it's were we being lied to for three years about, Do about Joe Biden's mental capacity? For three years, people were covering up. They were pretending like the guy was still all there when he clearly wasn't all there. Where's the demand for the medical records for that? Just the, 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 the audacity to be getting up in this environment on something that's completely inconsequential about whether or not Donald Trump was hit by shrap metal or a bullet, it doesn't matter. They still tried to execute him on live television. He still got lucky. They still didn't hit him. It does not matter. And while it very much so does matter if they were lying to us about Joe Biden and where his health was at, you're gonna demand the health. Like, fine, let's open up all the health records. It's just a wild claim. And then I enjoyed this. This was uh, from the Wall Street Journal. It was an op-ed about, did God save Donald Trump? All right? And I, by the way, I was joking about it that we clearly saw a miracle on live television that Donald Trump was saved by God. But like, I, I, I take that back and first, let me read what this guy says first. So it is with Mr. Trump who loves winner and despises losers, Christ embraced losers. They were his, pi they were, they were his people, his favorites. The last, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And Mr. Trump's doctrine, the first shall be first and the last loser and the last are losers and suckers. But who are we to speak for God? God saved him, so maybe God prefers winners. Maybe that's what God was telling us. I mean, if you're gonna look at this situation, which by the way, just brings me to the point, who on earth can speak for or against divine intervention? Because just think about this for a second. If God actually did intervene on that day, so you're telling me God caused a miracle but still needed to kill the firefighter? That's, that's what you think? God, God created a miracle with the bullets but still said, hey, fuck that guy. He was like, I'll keep Donald Trump, but these other people, like Donald Trump could be up there, I'm so important, God saved me. Anybody can put out a fire, we all know that. Believe me, you can even pee one out. <laughs> But I'm just saying the concept of anyone speaking for divine intervention. Like imagine, well, I'm Jewish, it's like the Hanukkah story. It, the Hanukkah story was uh, we witnessed a miracle of that there was oil for eight days, but everyone ran out of food. You know what I mean? It's like, then it's not a miracle. The miracle would be if nobody was harmed and then you could go, holy shit, what the fuck happened there? But when random people were killed, like do you think, do you think God really steps in like that and says, fuck other people? All right. What was that? Wait, say that once more. I just didn't hear you. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, and then this was from the latest from the FBI after Donald Trump got very upset and he said, how dare you say I wasn't struck by a bullet? So they changed their tune. They said Trump injury caused by bullet FBI fines, but they still, they left it, they kept it petty. 
They kept it petty. They couldn't, they co just couldn't give the victory to Donald Trump. Here's what they said. What struck former President Trump in the ear was a bullet, whether the whole or fragmented into smaller pieces fired from the DC subject's rifle. Does it fucking matter? <laughs> Just give the guy that he was hit by a bullet. It does not, like, like they, they went from, they tried the storyline of, oh, it wasn't even a bullet, everyone got upset, and they can't, it, like, they so can't just, like, admit to anything ever that they're like, well, we don't have the evidence yet, and that it could have been a partial bullet. We don't know that it was a full bullet. Who gives a shit? Potato, potato. Exactly. All right, and then last thing on this topic, Thomas Massey grilling Chris Ray. Let's Woo! give this a listen. Yeah! Yeah! Cassie yeah. Massey. Good to have Mr. Massey back with us today. Some of us had a chance to nice words from Jim Jordan. Go to Kentucky over the last few weeks and visit with Thomas and his family and hear all kinds of wonderful stories about Rhonda. Amazing, amazing lady, uh, gentle spirit, and uh, we we're glad to have Mr. Massey back with us. And uh, next five minutes belong to you, Congressman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Director Ray, how many counter snipers were present at the rally that day, and which of the counter snipers took the shot that took out the would-be assassin? Uh, I don't, I don't have the number of counter snipers. <laughs> I know it was a Secret oh, Service uh, counter sniper who, who took the uh, the shot that uh, eliminated the shooter. Um, we've conducted a number of interviews, including of of him. So. Let's just pause there. What the fuck? How the fuck do you not know that? I know. Like, can you have gotten easier questions? You're telling me you've had, uh, what, like 10 days or two weeks at this what point? The You're the guy who's supposed to be in charge of this. You've literally had all these conversations. And, like, why is all basic information just an unknown? I don't know. He did it. Pointing at him. It's like, at what point do you have to actually know something to keep your job? Not, it was it one of the two that we see in the videos on top of the roof, or was it a different location that I, I'm afraid I don't have that at my fingertips here. <laughs> How could you not know that? How was that not something that they just told you? I hit the guy. How is someone not even taking credit for that? You would think if you're the guy who took out the shooter, you'd be on the news by now, like that SEAL Team 6 guy who claimed Osama bin Laden. You know what I mean? Like, you would want the credit. You would be out on the bars being like, I did that, right? Like, but how is this an unknown? It's, a, it's incredible. Okay. You mentioned that uh, the would-be assassin bought a five-foot ladder. You have a credit card evidence of that. But it looks like on the scene there was a larger ladder that he might have used. Do you know which ladder he used to get to the roof? And do you have possession of that five-foot ladder and the other ladder? The other ladder was the uh, Secret Services ladder. <laughs> it's the one that we uh, propped up for him. And do you know how the taller ladder got to the scene? So this whole business about the ladder is something we're drilling into more. Um, we're drilling into it. I can't answer that at this time. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's new. It's new information. Uh, we do have possession uh, of the uh, the five foot ladder that he purchased um, close in time to uh, his attempted assassination. Uh, that we traced the purchase of that ladder from a receipt. A bloodied receipt uh, that he had on him at the time. Oh, come on, man. All right. And then, uh, well, passport. what was that? That was like the 9 11 passport that fell out of the plane. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. All right. Um, this was, uh, I, I'm not complaining the Netanyahu speech. I think we, uh, we covered that in part of the problem. I'm sure you guys uh, yeah. already saw that. I will rehash this point, though. So this was Netanyahu makes controversial address. This is from The Week magazine. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave um, a rare address to a joint session of Congress on Wednesday amid ongoing protests over Israel's war in Gaza. Who said what? Netanyahu lauded the U.S.-Israel relationship while blasting, lambasting the large demonstration across Washington, D.C. over... Um, his presence. For all we know, Iran is funding the anti-Israeli protesters that are going on right now outside this building, Netanyahu said. He earned his biggest cheers for calling protesters Tehran's useful idiots, the New York Times said. And to me, it's like I, I listen to these things and it's all, I, I, like I've said, it, it's just a game of he who smelt it dealt it, right? It's him out there going, hey, you guys farted out there. And it's because they're doing this. They're the ones that actually influence massive, you know, United States politics. They're the ones that, like, do the massive online media campaigns. And then he shows up here and he goes, oh, it was Iran that did it. And then just kind of speaking to what kind of influence Israel actually has. 
So this was Netanyahu sat down for dinner with Trump. I don't know if you guys saw the video. Trump opens up the door, gives his wife a hug and goes, you will never have eaten this good ever. Like very excited to have them. Um, and it was odd to see because if you guys remember, Netanyahu threw Trump under the bus. He was one of the first people that stood up in the last election to congratulate Joe Biden for winning. And uh, you would have thought that Donald Trump might have been quicker to at least maybe support Israel, but to give Netanyahu a tough time. And coming into the election, I guess he's realizing if he wants to win, he's got to side with Israel as well. Um, and then Netanyahu meets with Biden and Harris. This was a quote from the Wall Street Journal. I want him to finish it up and get it done quickly, said, uh, said Trump of Netanyahu. You've got to get it over done quickly because they are getting decimated with this publicity, which, it, you know, it's so Donald Trump where he's like, if you want to kill civilians, it's okay, but you got to quit with the drip drip because it doesn't look good. It's like, you know what I mean? He does not care about the humanity of the situation in any capacity. He's just going, hey, the way you guys are doing this is getting bad publicity, so it's time to wrap it up. All right, um, and then, all right, just two more topics that I wanted to cover before I do. Let's thank our other sponsor of the Run Your Mouth podcast, YoKratom.com, home of the $60 kilo, the only place in the entire world you can get an entire kilo of Kratom for just $60. And I know one of you guys just showed us your sheets. Who wants to do a kilo of Kratom up here? Yeah, show, show, show us the kilo of Kratom. Yeah, who's, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um... More drivers for Go Insurance, raising costs for everyone. And uh, I think, to me, there's something inspiring in this story. Let me read this. His license was suspended, and he paid about $250 in fines. Person said in a court um, ordered when he got a certificate of financial responsibility to get his license back, he has yet to do so. At this point, it's been seven years, he said, I don't really care about everything else in my life because I used to wake up, go to work, and arrive for my children. What's interesting to me is that like, there's something cool about people opting out. And it, like this, it, it happens more for financial reasons. Like the only reason the whole COVID thing worked was because they were willing to send people's checks, right? And there's something that happens when people are so down now where they're just like, I have to just work. I have to just go do these things. And so it's interesting with insurance because from what I understand, it seems to me and I listen, don't not get I have car insurance and I have max coverage it, it for me. I, I don't know how I don't have any tickets in the last five years. Like, so I just my, my insurance rates are not terrible. Um, but and I have max coverage. That's the way I live my life. But from what I understand, if you end up in an accident and you're responsible, the lawyers are basically going to be able to take whatever the max coverage is. I think it's pretty rare that they're actually able to get people's financial assets to the point that if you're driving around without any insurance whatsoever, I, I, unless you have significant fi financial assets, what can they do to you? Which is not to say don't have insurance. I'm not, I'm not saying that, and I'm also not saying be reckless, but there is something interesting about the system that like when you have nothing to lose, what can the system take from you and what can they do to you? And the answer is not a whole lot. And so there's something like in this case, what they're basically saying is that it creates a problem with insurance and in that if less people are purchasing it, then it drives up prices for the people that do which creates a bit of a mess for everybody if like people are just opting out. But there's just something interesting to me about inflation, getting people to the threshold where they're just like, I cannot participate in the system anymore at these prices, which I think is something like change only happens, or this is a quote, I think that, I don't know, I heard this from some preachy salesperson at some point that change only happens when it's uh, um, less painful than saying the same, something along those lines. But there's something about like the financial problems that we have in this country of the way that we deficit spend that usually the consequences aren't there so it's very easy to ignore there's something about inflation that actually reinforces hey these policies are unsustainable and in terms of just like witnessing the breakage of how that's unsustainable it's firstly i mean it's like something tucker carlson talks about all the time but it's people that are choosing not to get married people living the kind of lifestyles where like i can't get ahead but there's something almost uh cleansing to me in a way of people just opting out of the system because they're like, this thing just doesn't work and I can't possibly win this game and I just have to go through my life and I gotta make a living, so I'm just gonna do it that way. But you see how there's something like good from, from an hour perspective, having watched what happened with COVID and everyone buying into the system and willing to be fucking sheep and just taking orders and directions. There's something nice, even if it's for financial reasons of people backing out and just being like, fuck you, I'm not doing that thing. I'm driving my car because I got to show up to work. 
and you guys got to figure out how we can live in a world where I can afford to drive my car to work because I have to go to work. And what are you going to tell me? I can't do a job? Well, how's that going to be sustainable? How does that, like, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's something nice about the breakage of people just being non-compliant towards government laws that maybe reforces them to actually fix some of what we've seen. All right. And then last, uh, no, no, no. Well, there was an article about uh, uh, swimmers that they all pee in the pools. Um, yeah. <laughs> which I've never, like, dude, I swim, I never pee in the pool. But if the Olympians are doing it, then you just told me that's the way to swim in a pool, right? Yeah. Apparently, apparently, that's the proper way to do it. Like, yeah, that, that's what they were saying. They were like, none of us don't pee in the pools. Um, what was that? Yeah, and then I don't, um, I mean, like, as a kid, I did, but as an adult, um, I will get out of the pool to pee because it's fucking disgusting. And then someone once told me that they had, like, that red dye or whatever, and I'm a sucker, you know? I'm a sucker for it's going to look like I'm having my period and everyone will realize I'm actually a lady. I'm a sucker for that kind of a thing. What was uh, That's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then, th yeah, then you, then you just have to be swimming and going, there's a fucking shark in here! <laughs> that was disgusting. Um, all right. And now, to close out the show, here's Mike Pence. He got a lot of political process co going around, and he just wants to remind the world that he's the world's biggest hand job, so let's give it a listen. I want the people to know that I had no right to overturn the election. And then on that day, President Trump asked me to put him over the Constitution. But I chose the Constitution, and I always will. I just want to remind everyone if uh, uh, Kamala 